Hi again everyone, it's Chris Tisdale here and in this presentation I'm going to discuss with you a new approach to the analysis of solutions to fractional differential equations. So the basic idea um, of this video is to show you some interesting applications of ideas from analysis and in particular I'm going to apply them to the existence of solutions to uh, fractional differential equations. So I'm going to look at two, two um, reasonably abstract results which I'm going to apply. They are the artzeller ascoli theorem and the Weierstrass polynomial approximation theorem. So essentially I'm going to prove uh, a result uh, in a special way that hasn't been proved before using these two results explicitly. Now, if you want to get the notes for this video and follow along, uh, I'll post the PDF online and I'll also, um, I'm also hoping to post an iBook uh, of this presentation. So if you use iBooks, let me know please in the, uh, in the comments section. Okay, so the, the basic idea of this presentation is to answer the following question. When do initial value problems, or IVPs, involving fractional differential equations, when do problems like that have solutions? Now by a fractional differential equation, I just mean a differential equation where the um, order may not be an integer. So you, know, you could have a half derivative or something like this. And these, these types of problems have been very popular over the last 10 years with, uh, with research. Now, to answer this question, I'm going to apply these two results that um, I mentioned at the start of the video, artzeller ascoli and Weierstrass approximation theorem. Now, essentially what, what we do is we show that we can set up some sequences of functions that have uniformly convergent subsequences and whose limit is a solution to our problem. So essentially the question of existence of solutions just comes down to the existence of a limit and whether or not that limit has certain properties. Okay, now what is the significance of the, the result that I'm going to show you? Well, um, the, the, you can be, the, uh, the result can be traced back to Piano for um, just regular ordinary differential equations and the, the conclusion is that, or the, the benefit is that um, if certain problems satisfy the conditions of the theorem that I'm going to show you, then we know that the uh, problem has at least one solution. Now like I said earlier, the, um, the ideas are new uh, in the proof of the main result and in particular I claim that the approach of using Weierstrass and Artella Ascoli simplifies existing approaches in the literature. Um, why? Well, mainly because there's no reliance on fixed point theorems or nonlinear analysis. So, for example, you know, some people have proved um, the result that I'm going to show you via uh, the Schauder fixed point theorem. Well, that, that's not necessary uh, because we're going to use Weierstrass and Artzilla uh, Ascoli. So, it, this means that the ideas have a uh, you know, have the potential to appeal to a wider audience, someone who doesn't necessarily know any fixed point theory or any um, nonlinear analysis. Okay, so let's define the problem and uh, do some preliminaries. So first of all, I'm going to let this capital R denote the following rectangle. So T is on some closed and bounded interval and um, essentially a picture of this region would look something like this. Now there's nothing special about having zero here by the way. Okay. Now this is going to be the domain of our F on the right hand side here. Okay, so this distance here would be capital B. Okay, so think of this as a, some sort of domain of, a, of, a fun, of your function f here. Okay, the problem that we're going to consider is 
a so-called initial value problem or IVP involving a fractional uh, derivative. So the Q here is going to be between z strictly between 0 and 1. Uh, you can define it for, for larger values than that, but um, for example, if Q equals 1, this just breaks down to the regular derivative from you know, a first course in calculus. Okay, now f for these values of Q, we can define dQ via the following. Okay, it's known as the riemann louisville fractional uh, differential operator for Q between 0 and 1. Okay, so there's a, the question of solvability is the one we're going to look at. Okay, so this is a problem or equation 1, if you like. Okay, so what do we mean? If we're going to look at solutions, what do we mean by a solution to, to, to this problem? Well, you know, the, the short answer is a function such that the left hand, x of t, such that the left hand um, is, uh, left hand side of this equation is defined, the right hand side of this equation is defined and they're equal, and also the solution satisfies the initial condition. Okay, now you may be wondering, what is this x naught doing here? Well, you know, this, this will disappear, for example, when q is an integer or q equals 1 or something like this, and you'll just get the regular first order uh, initial value problem that you see in a first course in, say, um, uh, differential equations. Okay, so here are the, all the dot points for what we you know, technically mean by a solution. You know, um, we need to find a function x of t and an interval i such that, essentially, on that interval, the two sides of this equation are well defined and equal, and um, the initial condition holds. So this is just all these things sort of you know, uh, written out in detail. But, but essentially the underlying principle here is that we want to find an interval i and a function x that satisfies each of these uh, con um, parts of the definition. Okay, so I'm going to present some sufficient conditions under which solutions to our initial value problem 1 exist. Now, these solutions are called local solutions because they may or may not extend to the whole um, t interval for which f is defined. Okay, so they're just locally defined um, near the point t equals 0 to the right in this case. Okay, now I'm not going to talk about whether or not solutions are unique um, to this problem. Uh, those, those ideas will be uh, talked about somewhere else. And in fact, I'll give you a reference at the end of the paper where you can find a little bit more um, about the uniqueness of solutions. Now, we, we will s briefly mention it later, but, but there'll be no real detail there. Okay, well, it's very standard in the analysis of initial value problems and in fact boundary value problems uh, and so on to convert the problem to a single equation known as an integral equation. Okay, so we are going to study an equivalent integral equation and the, the reason that we do that is because they are of a more useful or tract tractable nature than the actual fractional differential equation and the initial condition. So that, that's our first step. So this is one of the lemmas that I'm going to um, uh, rely on in the proof of our main result. Now, the proof, I'm going to leave the proof, I'm not going to talk about that in this uh, particular video. You can find the proof either in the PDF or the iBook um, that I'm going to post online. Okay, so, so what, does, what does this say? Well, if the right-hand side of our fractional differential equation F is defined on R and, uh, conti and is continuous, then the initial value problem 1 is equivalent to the following integral equation. Okay, so what do I mean when I say um, these two two problems are equivalent, it means x is a solution to our original IVP on an interval i, if and only if x is a 
continuous solution to this problem on the interval i. Okay, so essentially what we're going to do is an, a, a, analyze this equivalent integral equation and then we can make conclusions about solutions to our original IVP1. Okay, so here's just, a, I'm just going to put the, um, put the proof up. Essentially it's just an uh, application of the fundamental theorem of calculus for, um, from, from fractional calculus. Okay, so I'm just going to just flick through that, but if you want the details, just go and have a look at the iBook or the PDF online. Okay. Now our approach, uh, like I said at the beginning of the video, is going to rely on constructing uh, sequences of functions that uh, have a, a, a limit, a uniform limit. Um, so I just wanted to quickly speak about uh, the idea of uniform uh, convergence. So we're going to rely on sequences of continuous functions that have a convergent or uniformly convergent subsequence. Okay, so let's just quickly skim over the idea of uniform convergence and its desirable properties. So suppose uh, phi sub k is a sequence of continuous functions defined on some interval. We say that phi sub k converges uniformly on some interval i to, say, a function phi, if, given any positive number epsilon, there exists a positive integer n, so that's for each t in the interval, this inequality holds whenever k is larger than this, this integer n. Okay, and we write phi sub k with this right arrow to phi uniformly on i. Now the n here is some positive integer and it only it depends on epsilon and not on t or k. Okay. Now why is this definition important? Well uniform convergence of um, sequences of continuous functions uh, can lead to really nice um, um, properties. And here are two nice properties that we're going to use. First of all, the limit function phi must be continuous. So in other words, uniform convergence of a continuous sequence of functions preserves continuity. And the limits and integrals of the, the sequence of functions may be interchanged. So in other words, if you have the limit of some um, integral where the sequence of functions is inside the integral, then you can push the limits inside and uh, move to, to this phi of s. So this is actually a special case of what's known as Lebesgue's um, dominated convergence theorem. But, the, but we're going to use both of these things to our advantage a bit later. Okay, so how do we achieve uniform convergence? I gave a, a reasonably abstract definition here. What we would like is um, sufficient or, or, um, and possibly also necessary conditions such that you're given a, uh, or you construct a, a sequence of functions, how do you know whether or not it converges uh, uniformly? So to answer this, the ideas of equicontinuity and uniform boundedness, okay? are now going to be talked about. All right, we call a sequence of functions uniformly equicontinuous on some interval i if the following holds. Given any positive number epsilon, there's a delta that depends on only on epsilon, such that if t1 and t2 are in the interval i, such that t1 minus t2 absolute are less than delta, then we have this inequality holding for each k. Okay, so this is important that this holds for each k. Now, um, it turns out that our in interval of interest i is going to be a closed and bounded interval, something like you know, something like this. Okay, in this case, uniform equi equicontinuity and equi equicontinuity are equivalent. I haven't explicitly defined what equicontinuity are, but you may have seen that in in other courses. So for sim simplicity, we've just mentioned uniform equicontinuity above, okay? All right, so what's an example of a, of a sequence of functions that would be uniformly equicontinuous? Well, 
if for each k, phi k satisfies this kind of inequality where p and uh, the gamma are positive constants, then phi k is uniformly equicontinuous. So uh, as a little exercise, what you might want to do is take this and show that the sequence must be um, uniformly equicontinuous on I. Now the um, other kind of corresponding part to this section is uniform boundedness of a sequence of functions. So we call a sequence of functions phi sub k uniformly bounded on an interval i. If there's a positive number q such that phi sub k of t is less than or equal to q for all t in the interval and for each k. Now the q here doesn't depend on t or k. Okay, so with the ideas of uniform equicontinuity and also uniform boundedness of sequence of continuous functions, we can now present the one of the really big theorems from analysis, which is due to the mathematicians Arzella and Ascoli. Um, now I'm just going to uh, have it as an if-then statement. In fact, uh, it's true if and only if. Um, uh, and, and the reason is that I just want to try to keep it uh, as simple as possible and this is, this is enough for what we want to do with the theorem. Okay, So, if phi sub k is a sequence of functions, say defined on some um, closed and bounded interval, that's uniformly equicontinuous and uniformly bounded, then it has a subsequence, at least one subsequence, that converges uniformly on that interval. Okay, so that's the Arzella Ascoli theorem. So, uniform convergence, uniform equicontinuity, and uniform boundedness, and a closed and bounded interval. So, that's a very, very famous theorem from, from analysis. Okay, we're almost, um, we've almost reached the via stress. Approximation theorem, but just a little bit more housekeeping first. Um, in what follows, let M be any constant such that the right hand side from our differential equation, the right hand side from our differential equation, F, satisfies this bound on the rectangle R. Now the rectangle R is closed and bounded and F is continuous. So we can always choose, it. given any F, we can always choose an M such that this, this is true. Okay. In addition, I'm going to define a number alpha by the minimum of these two values. Now the gamma here is just the, the regular gamma function and gamma is to be the minimum of these two values if you like. So the B comes from the rectangle the Q comes from the order, the fractional order of the differential equation, and the M comes from the boundary, and the B is just this number here, the, the sort of the right-hand endpoint of the T interval, the little b. Okay, now the, the following result is one of mine. Um, I published it um, in this paper here uh, in 2012. You can go and look it up, it's in the references. Suppose G is continuous and let M1 be a bound on this G on the same rectangle as I showed you before. If there's a constant, positive constant L, such that G satisfies this inequality for all pairs of points in the rectangle L, then this IVP, which is the same IVP as before except I've got G here instead of F, has a unique solution on this interval where beta is the minimum of these two values. So the M1 is, comes from here. Okay. Now this condition here is a famous condition known as a Lipschitz condition. Okay. And um, uh, you can see that this is a lot like the definition of alpha that I, that I gave you before, but I've got an M1 here instead of an M. All right. 
Um, I'm not going to prove this result. You can go and look up the proof if you want to uh, in the paper. But we're going to use this, and, and in particular, we, the, the conclusion is going to be very important. That we, if, if, F, if G is bounded by M1 on the rectangle Lipschitz, um, th then the initial value problem with G on the right-hand side has a unique solution on this interval. Okay, so we're going, to, we're going to come back to that or use it in, in the proof of our main result. Okay, we're almost there now. The Weierstrass approximation theorem. A huge result from analysis. Uh, I believe Weierstrass proved this result when he was 70 or in his 70s. It's a very, very famous theorem. Um, and it's going to be foundational to... Um, uh, the approach or the proof of our main result today. It essentially says that continuous functions on rec of, say, two variables on rectangles can be closely approximated by polynomial functions. So that, that's, you know, that's r amazing, really. So here it is. So this is via stress. Okay. Suppose f is defined on the rectangle that I showed you at the start and, it, and is continuous. Then for each positive value epsilon, there is a polynomial p such that this inequality holds for all points in the rectangle. So this is a major, major result. So essentially it says that given any f, I can always approximate it as close as I like by a polynomial. Okay, so let's present the main result. We've done a, a lot of groundwork here, but I wanted to show you the, um, the result and the, the new proof. So let's move on to the main result. Before I show it to you, I'm just going to briefly outline the, um, the, the motivation behind it and, and, and what's actually going on. What we're going to do is take this problem. I'm going to approximate the right-hand side with a sequence of polynomials. Okay, I know I can do that using the Weierstrass polynomial approximation theorem. Then what I have here is a sequence of initial value problems where the right-hand side is a polynomial. I can then use this theorem to get a sequence of solutions to the, the polynomial problem, if you like. I can then use um, the Artella-Rascoli theorem to show that that sequence of problems has a con uniformly convergent subsequence, and you can show that the um, the limit of that of the of the subsequences are actually a solution to the original problem one. Okay, so that's basically the idea here. Okay, so. The piano type result, the main result of this presentation. If f is continuous on the rectangle, uh, then the initial value problem 1 has at least one solution. Now, that's an amazing result for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because all we're asking is for f to be continuous. That's it. Nothing else, just continuity. Okay. And secondly, this is, a, this is an interesting result because... The conclusion is has has at least one solution. Now, we're not talking about one and only one solution. There may be one solution. There might be more. Okay? All right. Now, this result is, is known. Okay? This is not a new result. Um, you can see the result in this paper here, if you like, and this is in the references. But I'm going to provide a proof just for the, uh, for the case Q between 0 and 1 that doesn't... That, 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 that is different, if you like, from, these, from, from the proof that, that um, these mathematicians provided. And I think it's actually simpler. Okay? Because you don't need to know um, Schauder's fixed point theorem. You don't need to know what a compact map is. Okay? All we're going to rely on is Weierstrass uh, polynomial approximation and Artella Ascoli. Okay. Now, like I outlined before the, um, uh, like a little bit earlier, what we're going to do, we're going to choose a corresponding sequence of polynomials. 
such that this is true. Okay, and in particular, we're going to choose uh, epsilon sub k to approach zero. Oh, it doesn't actually. It doesn't have to pr uh, approach zero um, monotonically, but it just approaches zero from the right. Okay. So I know for each um, k, Weierstrass's uh, polynomial approximation says that that this is that this I can always choose a polynomial such that this is true. Now we replace our we replace our f in our original IVP by a sequence of polynomials and we get this sequence of problems here. Okay? Now, from this inequality here, with a little bit of work you can show that the P sub uh, that that our sequence of uh, polynomials satisfy the same bound as F. That is, the sequence of polynomials P sub K satisfy this bound for each K and all points in the rectangle. Okay, so you just use this to, to just rearrange this and, and use the bound on F. Now, one of the properties of polynomial functions on closed and bounded intervals, like our rectangle, is that they are Lipschitz. Okay, so P sub K satisfies a Lipschitz condition of type 3 for each K. Okay, so for each k there's a say a, a value l, let's say l sub k, such that this satisfies with with g replaced by p sub k. Okay, and this is true for each k. So there's a corresponding sequence of positive integers l sub k, such that this is true. Well, wh why is that true? Well, the the reason is that polynomials. If I differentiate the polynomial with respect to the second variable. On the rectangle R, that um, derivative is going to be continuous and uniformly bounded. And there's a theorem that says, okay, well, um, for those types of functions, they've got to be Lipschitz, okay? And in fact, I have a video about that, which I, which I, I can put a link to. So we conclude that each of our sequence, uh, our sequence of problems here. For each k, there's a unique solution by this theorem 8. That lies on the interval 0 alpha. Okay? So M here, um, you know, you might say why not a beta from theorem 8? Well, that, that involved M1. Here I've just got an M, okay? So it would be 0 alpha according to our original um, definition of alpha back here, okay, down the bottom. Okay, so for each k, our sequence of polynomial problems has a unique solution, x sub, x sub k, on this interval here. Okay, so this problem has a solution. What we're going to do now is show that the sequence of functions that exist have a convergent subsequence that converges uniformly to a solution of our original, our original problem uh, one. Okay? And we do that using Arcella Ascoli. Okay, so what does Arcella Ascoli rely on? It relies on uniform equicontinuity and uniform boundedness. If we can show those two things, then we know that, that the sequence must have a um, uniformly convergent subsequence. Okay, so the claim is these x sub k are uniformly bounded and uniformly equicontinuous. Now for the uniform bound, that, that's pretty easy to show. Um, it follows from the conclusion that this solves my sequence of polynomial problems. Okay, so to be a solution to this problem, the, the graph of x sub k has to lie within the rectangle R. 
Now the rectangle R is bounded, okay? So what this means is for each K and each T, we have our sequence of solutions satisfying this. So in other words, the, I mean, this, this is exactly what, what's needed for uniform, uh, a uniform bound on X sub K. Now the showing the uniform equicontinuity of X sub K is a little bit trickier. So essentially what you, you want to do um, is show that this can be made small whenever, say, T2 and T1 are close together, okay? Now, here I've discussed the case where T1 is less than or equal to T2. The case when T2 is greater than T1 is, uh, sorry, when T1 is greater than T2 is, is almost the same. Okay, so I've just taken a difference here and an absolute value. Then I've inserted a term. Uh, that should be a T1 there. And if you um, estimate these, you can come up with the following inequality. Okay? So you know that, I mean, this can be made small when this is small. Okay? And because of this, this is, of course, well defined. Okay? So we have the uniform equicontinuity of our, of our sequence. So what does this mean? It means that X sub K must have a uniformly convergent subsequence of functions. Now, because um, the X sub K's are continuous functions, the limit must also be a continuous function. Okay, so we know that this converges uniformly. The last thing to do is show that what properties does, does the limit function actually have? Does the limit function solve our original problem one? Okay, does this, this limit function solve the original problem one? Now, before we do that, firstly, we don't know how to construct the subsequence okay all we do know is that it exists we don't know how to construct the limit function all that we know is that it exists okay so these ideas are non-constructive okay so how do we get this last bit how do we how do we show that the limit function actually has the nice properties that we want it to have okay well let's take the subsequence and take away this uh, integral representation here this is equal to that integral expression, okay? So now what I can do is move, uh, actually just put absolute value signs in here, and I know by the polynomial approximation theorem, I can put less than or less than or equal to here with epsilon k sub n, okay? Now, I can move that out the front, I can integrate what's, what's left and come up with this inequality. Now if I take the limits above for each t in this interval, this, this goes to zero, okay? Okay, that goes to zero. If I take limits up here, because I, I know I have uniform uh, convergence, I can move the limit inside, this is going to go to f x comma x of s so I get that this is going to go to x of t so for every t in this interval I end up with the absolute value being less than or equal to zero so what does this mean it means that whatever's in the absolute value signs has to be equal to zero okay in other words this okay but this is just the equivalent, by, by the first lemma I showed you in this uh, presentation, this is just equivalent to the initial value problem one, the original problem. So I've shown that this problem has a solution, that's equivalent to showing that the initial value problem one has a solution. That is, our limit function x is a solution to our original um, 
problem on this interval. So that's the, the proof of the main result. Okay. Now let me just give you an example of how to apply the result. Okay, so let's go back to our original statement of the theorem. Here it is. Here's a, an initial value problem. Q is going to be, say, between 0 and 1. Uh, I'm going to claim that we can apply theorem 10 to show that this nonlinear initial value problem for fractional differential equations has at least one solution. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, you can see that the right hand side is definitely continuous, it's continuous everywhere. So it's certainly continuous on any rectangle that I find. If I was to define the rectangle here, Um, A would be 1, and I could choose B, uh, capital B to be anything I like, really. So, if it's continuous on, it, on any rectangle, say centred around uh, 1, and that's essentially all the conditions of the theorem. But it just asks you for F to be continuous on, any, on, on some rectangle centred around uh, A. So that's certainly satisfied. So that's all we really had to check. S continuous, all the conditions of theorem 10 hold, and so we conclude that our initial value problem has at least one solution locally defined in the neighbourhood to the right of t equals zero. So it's pretty easy to apply. You can see that theorem is, is only really one thing or one of the bit things to check. Okay, so here's the bibliography. Here is uh, D. Helms and Ford's article, which is an excellent pioneering article. And this is one of my recent ones where you can find the proof of lemma 8, where the Lipschitz conditions are involved. Um, so this, you know, I hope in this presentation you've um, you know, got a little bit of a taste for the usefulness of seemingly abstract results. For example, Artsela Ascoli and Weierstrass approximation theorem. I hope you can join me for more research presentations in the future.